Hello and welcome to Cities ABC video series podcast and YouTube channel. My name is Denise Guarda and I'm here to talk about ideas and the biggest challenge and solutions to the problems humanity is facing, the questions and challenges and how we can think bigger and out of the box and make the world a better place, especially when it comes to our cities and how we can actually create better solutions for the places where we live, for the organizations that we are working for and correlating for our society. And especially how can we use the innovation part that is coming from the fourth industrial revolution, society 5.0, digital transformation, to enable better empowerment of our day-to-day living operations and our solutions on a more sustainable and impactful way. In this series, we've been in profiling and interviewing some of the global thought leaders, authors, academics, CEOs, and actually ministers of some countries that are coming up with solutions and narratives that can improve and make the world a bit a better place. In this podcast and video series and the YouTube channel is part of the platform I co-founded, citiesabc.com. There is a new wiki for AR intelligent smart city tech digital platform for reinventing our cities using digital tools and data-driven innovation solutions that coexist and make the best use of blockchain and artificial intelligence. Today, we have with us Simon Cocking. Simon Cocking is someone that I deeply admire and I've been working for some time and is uh, the serial entrepreneur and founder, writer, journalist, and content creator, and the digital marketing advisor. He is the founder of Irish Tech News, that is a global leading technology hub that, based out of Ireland, has been actually showing cutting-edge research and a lot of very high-profile information about the best of technology for the last decades. Simon is, as well, the winner of the Irish Tech Uh, Web Awards 2014 Best Science and Technology category, the winner of 2016 Littlewood Best Ireland Blog for Digital and Tech, and with 20 years based in Ireland and uh, with an excellent network of contacts, um, Simon has been, besides Irish Tech New, writing for Sunday Business Post, Irish Irish Times, G Plus D, Dublin Globe, and a lot of other organizations worldwide. One thing interesting as well about Simon is as well was one of the first personalities talking about blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and as well involved in a lot of ICOs, some of them quite successful, and a lot of uh, initiatives around digital innovation and digital transformation. He is as well the co-founder of Global Action Plan, Active Art Creations, uh, Isolated Idea for Dublin Bike Scheme, co-founder of Rediscovery Center, Irish Flying Disc Association, a National Irish Ultimate Frisbee Coach. So, welcome to our series, Simon. A pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. That's a very comprehensive introduction. (laughs) So, Simon, can you tell us a bit about your background, your education, and as well, how do you come up to be uh, the person based in Ireland leading this platform, but a lot of the things you're doing right now? Sure. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, I guess, I guess the education helps to give a skeleton to walk through it maybe. So uh, I, I did the first round of education and I actually did a American history uh, in the 80s and the 90s in the UK and also over in Washington, D.C. Um, and we did a lot in terms of the U.S. and its relationship with Central America and South America. Um, and, you know, that's kind of quite interesting, uh, but I felt that that was only half of the picture. So then I did a master's in development studies where we looked at, Asia, India, Africa, and kind of the areas that are, uh, that are impacted by, by the West as well. And that was quite complementary. And in between the two courses, I had a year in Central America working um, with the Red Cross and various voluntary groups as well. So I, th- I think it's quite useful to both study, because obviously education is good, but also to, to be on the ground in places like Nicaragua and Honduras as well, and Mexico, so that you actually... Uh, see what the reality is and how people feel because it's a lot more nuanced than you might realize. So that would be the first wave of education. Um, then I came to Ireland. So I'm actually from London. And uh, so we worked in D- 
DC, uh, Madrid, um, Central America before moving to Ireland in the 90s. Um, and back then we wanted to do environmental education, but there wasn't really an awareness of why it was important to do that. Uh, but there was a lot of funding for community development. So, so through community development in uh, deprived and underfunded areas, there, there was a budget and they didn't really mind what you did as long as it engaged the community. So therefore we were able to do our environmental education through community projects. So we did it with kids, we did it with women's aid, we did it with minority groups. Um, and that was very good again, because you've got this, you've got your ideas about how things should be. But then if you work with people who maybe education is an issue or food security, even in, you know, poor areas of Dublin, which is obviously a Western country, but still had pockets of a lot of uh, deprivation as well. So again, I think you keep blending between theory and what you experience on the ground. And from that, they, they decided to do an EU regeneration of an area called Ballymun, which was by the airport and was very run down and referencing u two song, uh, Running to Stand Still, the seven towers that they see. So, you know, I, I knew about the area and we became environmental consultants for the regeneration. And for about 10 years, we had, I personally had an involvement in it. The project still goes, but after 10 years, we uh, moved on. But um, that was very interesting again, because you, you have these policies and you have these ideas, but then there are challenges. How do you actually make things change? And so thankfully, I guess, uh, I saw my mentor recently and we compared notes on that project 16 years later. And 16 years later, you can say it's a resounding success. But the thing is, is at the time, your funders are on three-month quarterly projects, so uh, KPI appraisals. So uh, I realized my skills were quite soft in terms of my education. So then, semi-reluctantly, uh, I went back to college in 2010 uh, and Ericsson had a retraining program for anybody that could pass... Uh, mathematical skills aptitude test they were training to be a software engineer and that was very interesting because then suddenly you went from being able to communicate to working out you were very deep into the tech side of things and um it was very interesting um but it showed that you still need people that can uh, mediate between developers and clients and what people need and and i definitely realized that well i learned a lot by doing software engineering but i realized i was a bad software engineer but I understood what could, what was possible and what wasn't possible with code and therefore how to help and work with clients. And so at the same time, Irish Tech News came along as a possibility uh, to communicate. And also it gives when you write about stuff, it gives you the great opportunity to ask dumb questions because everyone you interview is a specialist generally deeper in that particular area. Because, I mean, you mentioned AI and blockchain and the various aspects um, but, but even within them, there are niches and niches. And so, so if you're doing a story, it's okay. Well, if egotistically, if you can let go and say, okay, you tell me about it because I figure you know more about it than me and you're the developer of this particular tool. So th that led us on a journey where you're both learning, but at the same time, the more you learn, the more you're able to communicate and understand when other people do projects. So I guess that was the third wave of education. And then I think for all of us, uh, like recently, like we're doing podcasts now. So, to, to get the editing software audacity i had to download it and learn how to use it and so i spent a morning on that and I, I think for all of us if we're open to continuing to learn then it enables us to continue to function quite well with the world so i guess that's that's the answer about education in a in a relative thumbnail oh that's a lot of stuff there um so so i'm well it, it, you went through a lot of different things from development to technology and actually even more details in technology because you, you are a strategist right now and of course as well as journalists so how did it start uh, and let's go straight away because uh, for instance if you look at irish tech news you managed to make it right now is in the top 100,000 websites in the world according to uh, alexa and Great. Amazon, that's, so congratulations on that. It's not an easy task, being in consideration there's one billion websites. Um, so can you tell us a bit about the, how did you start with the Irish Tech News, which has been probably uh, the major project, at least that I know from you, that you've been mm. leading, and as well an aggregator of a lot of innovation around of it. I guess, uh, in some ways, uh, Irish Tech News works in a few ways because, um, well, I guess, first of all, your aspect of what did it begin with? Well, it began as being more of a gadget review site, 
to some degree. And that's my co-founder, John, and that's his interest. And he would say as a kid, him and his brother would discuss how the fridge work and then they take the fridge apart, you know? So, you know, the classic gadget tinkerer and therefore that aspect. Um, for me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more brand neutral. Um, there, there was a phase when uh, I, I used an Apple because that's what my girlfriend had and she taught me how to use it in the late 80s. Then in the 90s, you know, we had we had what we were given, so I used that. And we were in Africa and Namibia, so you just worked with what you had on the desk. And then mi the mid noughties well, I had a boss that loved Apple again, so he outfitted the office with Apple. So even before I got to Irish Tech News and s gadgets and stuff, uh, I, like if it does what I needed to do, then it, it works. You know, beyond that, uh, I'm definitely not in the walled Apple garden. Uh, Samsung have come along and I like what they do. Right now we're using some Pixel phones. I like them. So uh, that in that way, uh, I do do some gadget review, but it, but it's less my area of interest rather than what can it do and how can it help us to do things better or different than what we're used to. Um, so there has been that thread with Irish Tech News, but at the same time, I was a bit more interested in speaking to people like you, uh, innovators and entrepreneurs and people at the cutting edge. And um, like you mentioned, blockchain. And for a long time, we, 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 we engaged with blockchain to look at what could it do, particularly say with tech for good and how could it help. Uh, it was only after a couple of years of looking at blockchain use cases did we even start talking about the cryptocurrency side of things. So, so for a while, a lot of people, if they hear the word blockchain, they think of Bitcoin. Um, that would be a less interesting story for me because a lot of the stories are about the price, price up, price down, where will the price be? Whereas I find it far more interesting to look at um, in a world of a connected you, how can blockchain technology help you maybe with medical records or with, I guess, health or land ownership or musical rights? So therefore, um, the, the thread for me would be uh, what's interesting, what's coming down the road and how can it relate to our lives? And then equally, about a year, maybe two years ago, with Irish Tech News, we decided to, to pivot into more focus on green, green tech, clean tech, tech for good, renewable energies. Because we figured that, I mean, on one hand, so there are islands in Scotland that make 140% of their energy from renewable, from renewable sources. And they, they're in a different paradigm where they're discussing, what do we do with surplus-free energy? Do we heat our polytunnels? Do we power our cars? So that's a really interesting place to be in. Um, and, and the thing is, is, you know, like the William Gibson quote about the technology already being here, but not being very evenly distributed. The thing is, is that we probably have some very solid solutions already around us that if we put them all together, we probably could be living in a lot more sustainable way without a decline in our quality of life. It's just about bringing the pieces together. And therefore, you know, Irish Tech News, we aim to run as many different stories within the technology area as possible to some degree to see what gets traffic. But equally, um, I figure if we are favoriting some areas rather than others i think we should favorite the areas favoritize the areas that enable the planet to continue a sustainable way because if we don't then you know it, it's not in our own interests so i guess that's a kind of editorial concept overview but then equally you know i find it interesting to talk to people who've been on their journey and learn what did you do what worked what didn't work just to try and get a bit more of an honest insight from them in terms of the journey rather than as as bill gates will say you know we look back and we join up all the dots and every decision we made was wonderful whereas you know as bill gates said you know success is a terrible terrible teacher so it's more interesting to try and work out how people succeeded from the bits when they realized they weren't doing it right so i guess that is that editorial curiosity that then drives the stories that i like to do more of so i guess that's where we're coming from yeah fantastic and i think you've been doing fantastic work so, so i would like to as an entrepreneur and, and company founder, so can you tell us a bit that I think it's particularly interesting because let's say when you look at uh, media platforms like yours, they normally are managed by big groups and they are based in New York, London, San Francisco or Hong Kong or Singapore right now. Um, so having mm -hmm. something as big as what you guys created, especially and as well uh, with the echo that you have international, especially among the influencers, on, on technology is quite amazing. And as well, the fact that it's based in Ireland. Well, of course, Ireland is, <clears throat> is an, a technology hub, but it doesn't have the same outreach that you have, of course, in major Londons, New Yorks, and so forth. So can you tell us a bit about that part? I know that you are independent, you are privately owned by you guys, and as well, that component of uh, entrepreneurial part, which I think is key for our audience and as well for the people in my uh, YouTube podcast.
Sure. Okay, so there's a couple of elements. And I guess one, uh, and if you look at Ireland in the way that you look at Finland, Israel, Singapore, um, when, when it suits, we're an Irish company, you know, but on many other occasions, we would happen to be a company that's based in Ireland. And, uh, you know, statistics are great. So we started to look at our traffic and we realized that maybe a quarter of our traffic is Irish uh, with good chunks in the US, the UK, and then India, Germany, Singapore, and, you know, through the week, maybe 180 different countries. So, so what that showed us was, was that we don't have to just write about Irish stuff. If we do, great. But equally, w when we're getting views in India, it's because the search algorithm has supplied our stories um, to them. So, so we have an interesting paradigm that about 50% of our traffic is first time users. You know, so if you think about that, you go, well, that's nuts on one hand, because on one hand, that means we have a regular crew. And yet for half of them, the first time is the new, the new time is the first time every day. So what does that mean? Well, that means that people are finding us, apart from those who get the digests and the signups, the other ones are finding us based upon they wanted to read about a particular story. And we happen to be the place they came to. And, and even this raises, and if we're talking about insights for entrepreneurs, an interesting thing was, uh, I was due to go to Moscow a few years ago. And so we were just checking in with them that they could see the preview pieces we'd done. And they couldn't. And we were like, hmm. And so through a whole series of tracing, the previous internet, previous hosting company we worked with was blocking not just the traffic from, um, it, was, um, it was the Russian Robotics Institute. So they were completely just legitimate, but they were coming from Moscow. But what, what our company was doing was they were blocking any traffic from Russia. So it turned out we were losing traffic that we didn't know we might have been getting from Russia, Pakistan, Congo, places that were considered to be not normal sources of traffic for our site. So we realized that we were losing traffic we didn't know we could be losing and that we needed to have a better host um, and a more open. Obviously, you know, we had to blacklist some sites, but it turned out that their approach was blacklist everything unless told to add it. And this was, of course, as a media site, was costing us a lot of traffic. So. So from that, a couple of things came out. One, think about who, who you're hosting with and what your agreement is and how they're managing your traffic because you could be losing traffic you don't realize. And then from this too, once, once that block was removed and we switched companies um, and we, we work with Surfcentric now and they're great and we have a dedicated server and we have dedicated people to fix our problem. So that problems if they arise. So this has really helped and it's pushed the traffic up. So sometimes... There's a bit of push and pull on how do you grow. Some of it is is be good, be excellent, but also work out what things might be stopping you from grow that you don't even realize. Um, and that happened with us. Now, the other bit you said about that we're not owned by someone else, and we spoke about this a little bit editorially, it, it means that we don't have to run stories that we don't want to, and we can run stories that we want to if we think they're just interesting. And, and let's say maybe we need... 80 to 90 percent to be in our core areas but we're more than happy to then experiment and maybe do something on fashion and tech or oh i i don't know i you know i, so I used to say it's a joke almost that i try and wind up my co-founder by doing things as far away from tech as were possible but with some relationship some degree of interest and then to run the piece to to see what the traffic did and and what the response was and to know that you know we had our solid core of content that was tech focused, but we would like to stimulate and provoke our audience and, and to look at it from the perspective that, that you and I are the people we are and we're interested in things we do, but we're also human. And therefore, if we run some stories that maybe are outside of what we think we know we want to listen or read to, that might be interesting too. And, and ideally, this is the converse of the Netflix um, Amazon approach where if you like this, you might like that. And the trouble with that is, is that you end up being in a smaller and smaller spiral have served up similar and sim more and more similar sci-fi movies made on Netflix that, that algorithmically are quite close to the last one you watched. And that's good to a point. But then, you know, I, w I would like to be open to a wider range of influences than the algorithm thinks I need to see. So therefore, as in a human way, in an editorial way, uh, by not being owned by a big company, we don't have to do things if we think they're boring and we can do things that are slightly speculative if we think they're interesting. So... I think that makes it nice and it keeps it interesting, you know? No, no, that's impressive. And I think you, you're completely right. There's a lot of uh, innuendos that are coming out of uh, special... ...centralized. Ironically, with all the blockchain and everything else, we have very few media controlling this stuff. And I think 
that that brings me to one question related to what you said, uh, and I know that you are you have a very strong social impact driven attitude towards your work and ethics. Um, is that we are right now when it comes to technology, and you are a global expert in technology. Is that um, like you said, we are in in our tribes, and and as well, uh, I think in our case, and actually most of our audience are a bit more sophisticated. But we have a challenge, even if you see what happens with U.S. elections, with Brexit, and a lot of things, where there's a completely manipulation of media, and people actually get into this manipulation because they are fed by fake news and very very sophisticated, this functional and disruptive ways of communicating. So I want to, to ask you one question, and I think this is particularly important for what you're doing with Irish Tech News. Of course, you are talking about technology, but how do you see this challenge when it comes to, first of all, the media, which you are a media player, but as well, how can we clean this mess? Because at the moment, if you look at the internet um, and social media, it became a big marketplace of garbage, okay? And the garbage is all indexed more by the algorithms than actually the real content. Um, and the real content for us, if you're seeing, we're doing this interview and it's going to be distributed in YouTube, YouTube will change the algorithm probably next month and I'll lose part of my views. And uh, if I have a team working on this, they will have to start again to promote it. And ultimately we won't make much money out of this. And the same goes with Facebook, which is even worse. And, and this is a big challenge. We have a massive challenge that these big corporations, they right now, even if they had the no, do no evil in the beginning, they become in some ways very evil, let's be honest. I think we need to, to call the names and I, I don't have a problem about that because I, I keep on losing my traffic and getting my traffic. So I think on that level is, of course, they're not the worst and they, they did very good things and they helped democratize this, but all this these challenges, um, and I think especially on the media side, which is, I think we are in a very crazy year with COVID and with the US elections, with all the, the fake news and stuff like that, that is probably the biggest peak. And this is not new in the history of mankind. The difference is that uh, if this fake news would be controlled by a small elite in, in the middle age or stuff like that, the rest of the population won't be educated. Now the rest of the population is medium educated, but we have this, this functionalities of this, this proportion of uh, different things. So I would like to hear your opinion on that and, and knowing both your technology knowledge, but as well your media and thought leadership uh, at. Okay, so I think it's a good question and it's a difficult question and it's a massive challenge. So, so there's some high-end thoughts and some micro ones. So in terms of the high-end aspect, you could definitely see a couple, of, maybe two years ago, after Trump got elected, basically, uh, outlets like BBC, The Guardian, and others, were, and CNN, were working very hard to, to counter this by trying to do fact-checking in real time um, and to try and work out how is best practice. What do you do when somebody that you're trying to cover has thrown out of the window any uh, need to, to, to remain truthful. And, and therefore, you know, they, you know the whole uh, real-time fact-checking would be aspects of that. Um, at the same time, uh, I, I think those media organizations also have to try and work out their own filter bubble because something like The Guardian, um, I can only read alongside other things because I feel that it's slightly in its own filter bubble too. You know, and I think we as readers have to keep working out what do I believe in? Where are the outlets I'm going to read? What are they and what are their values? Because, because if you're not aware of it, you can remain in a filter bubble of self-confirming views. So therefore, it is very difficult where even you could say the more trusted outlets are, are wrestling with this. And even so the BBC and The Guardian, as an example, also laid off several hundred people, which would suggest that with the recent corona, they're losing revenue and therefore there are issues around that while still trying to maintain the whole point of journalism, which is to ask questions, check your facts and validate things. So um, I, I guess an example for us is that the, 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 we won't, we won't take articles submitted by anonymous authors. You know, uh, we, if, if somebody wants to do something with us or do submit an opinion piece, we need to validate as much as possible that they're actually a real person and not just a pseudonym or a front for someone looking to put a, a, an opinion out there because you know if, if we don't do this then i think we are part of the problem we have to keep assessing 
where did this story come from? Who are they? What's their agenda? Who do they work for? What's their background? And, you know, so how do you validate that? Well, we try to validate it by Twitter, LinkedIn to see if they have a real digital pro digital profile. And if they have none of that, then already we are like, I'm sorry, you're not a credible uh, source of an opinion for us and we can't use that. And then you would then, if they did have LinkedIn or Twitter, you'd go through it and see, well, when was the account created? Because obviously we all know there's a lot of bot accounts being created very quickly. And you look at it, is this an account that has a real uh, persona to it, you know, or is it something that just appeared last month and perhaps is part of a wave of fake news manipulation? So I think, you know, we must all try to do what we can do to validate the questions and the source of the news. And in some ways, you could say that goes back to basic journalism, that you do do that, you know, the what, how, what, how, why, who, where, you know, you do ask those questions and you do say, well, why are you saying that? And what, 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 are the, what facts are you basing that on? Um, now, obviously, we have the challenge that we have populist leaders that, 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 that don't want to engage in that way. But, but I think if I, I'm hopeful, I, I feel that Trump has passed the McCarthyist moment where people realize the emperor has no clothes. Now, I know he's still trying to do things to, you know, avoid his seeming defeat. But really, uh, I feel that in some ways it's been a good challenge for the U.S. to work out who are we, what is democracy, what does democracy look like, and how do we actually ensure that we remain that way. Now, now we can't be 100% sure of the election result, but I do feel that the pendulum has swung back. And in some ways, when you have someone or somebody who's more to the right in power, it does force other people to work out what's important to them and how you engage with that and how you articulate and fight back against those sort of points of view. So that's one thing. And, and, and so, so the media has a role to play in that. And I think to some degree, the, you, from those examples I was given about real-time fact-checking, they are working out how to do that. Now, you spoke about the algorithm for your video going up and down and the, uh, the undue influence of the YouTubes, uh, even Facebook, Twitter, and the rest. Now, Facebook, I've already found, is no longer a me, an outlet that I, that, that I find particularly important to push content to because, because even before we got to the, the issues with them not monitoring hate speech before, uh, they were already throttling the reach of things that you posted. So already you, you could only reach a wider audience if you paid. So already Facebook had gone down a very problematic and ethical, like as in, is it ethical path already? And in some ways I, f I feel that the, there's a reckoning due or coming with Facebook. And again, you know, the kids aren't really using it. Now, yes, they've gone and bought Instagram and WhatsApp and not everyone's always aware of, they may have sh shifted from one media outlet to another but it's something to be conscious of. Um, then the other aspect would be that, yeah, so with the algorithm, I think it's important to create good content and share it across your own platforms rather than worry about, to some degree, where the algorithm pushes you. Because as with Google's algorithms, they change all the time. And if you spend too much time trying to chase the, the wave of the algorithm, then you're always going to be more exposed to dips and falls. Whereas if you create good content, then I think people find you and you grow organically. So therefore, I think the long tail approach and the doing things well and doing it repeatedly, so it's an iterative approach, uh, serve you well in the long term. I'm completely with you, and I think very good points in a lot of ways, especially in the way, and I, and I like that you are optimistic. I, I still have some doubts that uh, we're getting into kind of a cyberpunk a new world, but we'll have that for another question. So, but but I think one of the questions I have, and going back as well with this, so you were, I think, in terms of technology, you've been going through the different waves of innovation that are coming, and you mentioned some of them in your professional background. But you've been very focused in blockchain technology, and that's well in crypto. You've been involved in a lot of ICOs, a lot of different areas, and some of them that became quite big. Um, at a certain point, you were one of the biggest, more influential uh, crypto ICOs uh, advisors. So can you tell us about that and I think how you see the evolution of crypto and, and of course, the separate blockchain technology? Um, yeah, so I guess in one way you go, uh, that was a crazy time, late 2017 into 2018 and you know uh events all over the world in dubai and you know south korea and the us and you know uh, a lot of money 
was raised very quickly. Uh, I guess if we contextualize that, when you had crowdfunding 1.0, it came along and everyone said, crowdfunding is wonderful, I can get anything made. And then the reality kicked in, that if it's not a good product, if you haven't done your preparation, it probably won't get funded and shouldn't get funded. And, and, and that's, that's, that precedes ICOs. So ICOs in some ways were crowdfunding 2.0, and there was a kind of slightly crazy land grab um, you know, with, with, the, with the background narrative of Bitcoin, you know, rising from a few cents to $50 to $300 to $2,000 and then going 1000 a month through the second half of 2017. So, you know, it definitely was a bit wild west. It definitely people felt that they were going to get rich quickly. And therefore, you know, that brought in all the sharks and the, uh, the questionable people as well. Um, and the interesting thing is the parallels with, you know, the first internet boom in the in the 90s where there were good products in there um but but some got uh, drowned out by the noise of 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 some of the the dubious ones um and so so with the gartner hype curve of everything's amazing and then oh oh we can't quite make it as soon as we thought we could and now we're in the valley of uncertainty and or disillusionment and we're gradually going to come out of it so so we definitely went through that over a two-year period of massive hype expectations and over optimistic timeframes of when things can be built. Um, if you toggle over to, to software development, uh, it's very hard to make something really fast and really well without having doing the bug checks and the, all, all the things that really need to be done to make sure it works well. And so in some ways, some ICOs got the money. Uh, Morpheus Network are one that did well for logistics where you move things using the blockchain to reduce time spent at borders. This makes sense. So there were, and, and there were a lot of uh, medical use cases as well. So there were some that made sense, could really help humanity and do things well. Um, got the money for legitimate reasons and are building products. So there are good things in it, but there are others who said, oh, I think I can make 30 to 50 million out of this um, and I'll buy a yacht or something. So I guess with all those things, it, there was a degree of buyer, de buyer beware, you need to do your research. Um, and then like anything, if something gets overheated uh, very much in 2018 and 2019, uh, then it all crashed and there was a lot of disillusionment and the price of Bitcoin and Ether uh, went the same way too. So, so it's quite interesting now because if, you spoke to, if we spoke about this in 2019, people would be quite uh, negative and say it was all hype and you know, it, it wasn't the thing that it said it was. Whereas actually it was the thing that it said it was, but things take time. And as we move into 2020, um, and particularly again with the coronavirus, it's been a massive push to digital and to do more things online, which which only works in ha hand in hand with blockchain, with AI, with IoT. So so if we look at ICOs as aiming to move quickly to build one of the pieces in the landscape of a more digital facing way of doing things, then you know I think already I think now and in three to five years time we'll see that. The, things got a little bit too overheated and overhyped, but the technology was moving along and it, it has brought us to an interesting place where we can do things. And particularly now, like I, I saw that the first driverless cars will be allowed to run on the roads in the spring, probably in the UK. And so therefore, you know, we've gone beyond, you know, um, speculative, wouldn't it be nice to these things are real and actual. And so this thing that moves autonomously on the road, your car, but could also be doing your shopping for you as well. And, and all these things uh, get stitched together between blockchain and the other elements that were needed for the technology. And, and some of the ICOs were just looking to raise funds in a way that they couldn't from traditional VCs. And so if we look at it in that context, it made sense and it did enable, you know, with the wisdom of the crowds or let the crowds decide, uh, some projects got funded that might not have got funded by traditional VCs. And, and with innovation, sometimes... Uh, you have to get you get funding from non-traditional sources because if you're that innovative, they just may not see how your opportunity relates. So I think if we contextualize it in that way, then a lot of good came out of it. Um, at the same time, back then we used to advise people, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true and stay well away from it. So, you know, um, you still have to be careful if you're choosing to invest money in things. And then with a lot of the ICOs, just because you can tokenize something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should tokenize it. And that was a hard question that not that wasn't got that didn't get asked about all of the things that looked to be tokenized. Maybe they moved too soon. Maybe it didn't need to be tokenized because then, if you tokenize wealth and assets, you need to have uh, 
a network who's planning to use it. And, and a lot of them don't have that or didn't have that. And the ones that are going to survive and the ones that are doing well are the ones like Ether or Bitcoin, where there's a strong use case for using it. And the ICOs were just aiming to follow that. So I guess it's a long answer. It's definitely an interesting time. But I think already uh, we're not in the same place now that we were last year. Oh, yeah, completely. There's a lot of things. And now there's uh, a lot of um, changes from ICOs to STOs as well, which increases the level of requirements for doing um, an innovative, uh, uh, well, security token, uh, which would be more or less the same. So um, on that level, how do you see this evolution of the, from ICOs to STOs? Um, and then the second question is, how do you see the blockchain technology? Because, of course, it's two different things. One thing is the funding part, which uses blockchain technology and all the token, which is right now uh, starting to come up again um, and a, a bit more regulated. But, yeah, let's see how we can do this. Yeah. So ICOs to STOs was logical, needed to happen. Uh, it was too free and too open, and um, there wasn't enough stringent criteria to be able to assess uh, who these people were, who were the founders, would they really do what they said they were going to do with the money? Um, and whereas, and also people believe that Bitcoin is anonymous, but it's not anonymous because you can track, you can, you can. You can view the transactions, you can see the holder. It's pseudo anonymous at best. And so with STOs, you know, like it's a logical play. It makes sense. And, you know, I don't think we'll be seeing many, many more ICOs. But I think if we talk about the context of crowdfunding and this as a way to tokenize, to, to raise funds, I think we will see more of this because it's, you know, the amounts that were raised showed that people are willing to invest in things they find interesting. And, you know, previously with stocks and shares, the threshold was so much more difficult. You had to buy a minimum amount. You had to pay a broker. There were so many more related costs to getting involved with something that you thought was worth backing. Whereas, you know, STO or whatever comes after it uh, will, will give investors a more secure way of doing this. So in that way, uh, I don't think there are many downsides to it. I, I think if you're not a scammer and you're not looking to take the money for the wrong reasons, then, then why would you have issues with this? And again, it, you know, it'd be about uh, KYC, know your customer and effective validation. These are all things that come into play, which are good. Um, and even with exchanges now, um, most exchanges now, the, the degree of, you know, either two-factor authentication or the degree of, you know, you have to supply a photograph of yourself with your passport with today's date and things. These are all things that are moving towards creating greater levels of security and really, you know, if you're legitimate, then there's no reason why you wouldn't be happy to have those degrees of security. So therefore, um, I think we're still going to see things like this, either in this form or an evolved form happen. And it makes sense because otherwise, say with the EY auditing, where they fail to do effective auditing um, for, oh, that, the big one, the bank, um, you know, that, 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 that due diligence wasn't carried out. So, so, so where we're going is more of a micro form of uh, checks and balances which protects everybody better. So I think it's a good thing. Yeah. So, so look, I mean, in many ways, uh, you could say that, you know, finance and porn are often the driving first points of innovation, yeah? Particularly the two together. I want this, how do I pay for it? How do I pay for this anonymously? Money and sex, right? So, so if we look at that as a, a context for driving innovation, well, well then very quickly, you know, you know, if I'm in Dublin, no, if I'm in Cork and I break my leg, and all my medical records are in a hospital in Dublin and the guys down in the emergency ward in Cork want to look at my broken leg, they can't find it. Whereas if you could have a black box of your medical records on the blockchain, then suddenly wherever you are in the world, when you need medical treatment, blockchain could enable you to have a far more effective level of personalized healthcare based upon your data, but stored on the blockchain, but obviously a private blockchain or a black box one where you only release the relevant data. So, so therefore, you can see the potential in the medical sector for blockchain-enabled technology is fantastic. You know, it could be really transformative, and because you know, medicine can then evolve into deeply personalised medicine, um, which is going to have better better success rates on the particular patient being treated. So, therefore, blockchain can. Do, it's almost as in there are as many use cases as you can conceive of it. Um, 
we spoke about land ownership. So in, in the uh, Tapscott's book, Blockchain Revolution, um, previously until now, you know, land registry might be in a, in a dusty uh, attic somewhere, uh, in a dusty cellar somewhere. And, you know, the dodgy mayor Tipex is out your name from the ownership of the land papers and suddenly claims the land for his own. Whereas if it's on the blockchain, for all the reasons that you, you know, you can't just say you made the payment twice because the whole point of blockchain is, is to prevent double payment. Similarly, blockchain can help with land ownership to have definitive records of who owns what. And therefore, even if the records get burned down in the particular place where they were stored, blockchain gives you a, a distributed cloud way to, to resolve previously issues that, that like Mugabe in Zimbabwe with land, land, you know, land seizures. Um, you could you could apply it in that way in positive ways to help small people that maybe had got pushed over before so those are two uh with the with the morpheus and the cross-border one again there's a lot of paperwork but some of it can be standardized it can be standardized and your blockchain talks to their blockchain and you're the shipping company and their customs uh just think it can move it through so much quicker so therefore I think I think there are many ways in which it can be useful. Um, it doesn't mean it's it's maybe the silver bullet to replace everything, but it could certainly be a lot better than what we have before. Particularly if what we have before are old, difficult to access records in one place that could be lost to storm or flood. So therefore, things in the cloud offer a lot of uh, exciting opportunities that we couldn't do otherwise. And, and blockchain for now is is the stepping stone that can take us to you, those use cases. So therefore, I think they're very interesting, and, and and we could we could talk all about that without ever mentioning cryptocurrencies, which I think can be good sometimes because the the, the trouble with the cryptocurrencies narrative is it's it's very tulip mania. How much is my Bitcoin worth today? Will it be twenty thousand? Will it be a hundred thousand? It's gone up. It's gone down. Whereas blockchain could be very helpful in our lives without us ever having to talk about Bitcoin. No, completely. So that's that's completely. So one other question right now coming from this. So if you look at um, uh, the areas of innovation related with the foundational technology, the, the so-called fourth industrial revolution and emerging technologies, uh, of course, after blockchain, um, it, it emerges, of course, artificial intelligence. Um, is been leading a lot of uh, innovation in technology. There's a lot of companies based in there, from the, the giants of Apple and and, uh, and Facebook as well, and Google's, which they have all operations for Europe there. And they are all leading the areas of uh, blockchain, specifically in, in media and so forth. But how do you see that area from what you've been doing? And we touched that, in spe especially in the area of algorithms and how this is affecting media. But it's much bigger than that. And of course, blockchain is much more, um, I would say, much more... Uh, advanced and, and much more dangerous if not used properly. So what's your vision on artificial intelligence from a strategic level, but as well as someone that has been working in technology in, in the nitty gritty details? Yeah, look, um, I, I think artificial intelligence can be a, a very worrying phase for people sometimes. Um, and yet, you know, behind the scenes, there are some aspects of artificial intelligence that, that already happen and already take place. And with predictive text or various aspects of the suggested algorithm, which while we have critiqued earlier, can be useful too, that if you like this, you might like that. So therefore, you know, we do, perhaps without realizing, already have some examples of AI working in the background already. And I guess like a lot of this technology, um, if it works well and gives us what we want in a faster and better way than before, then we like it. If, if it throws up uncanny or inaccurate results, then we don't like it. And therefore, there's a degree of um, uh, human quirkiness on that one about how we feel about it. Then if we look at the, you know, the Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk end of it, that AI is a massive risk. Well, <clears throat> this is definitely the case because... Uh, People or many humans find it hard to conceive uh, the concept of, you know, exponential growth, right? So, therefore, talk to some people about Google Translate and they'll say, oh, yeah, Google Translate sucks. I used it six months or 12 months ago and it was rubbish. And then you're like, yeah, but have you used it in the last day or so? You know, and maybe if you broke down into smaller chunks, uh, because the thing about it is, is that, you know, it, 
it's, it's a brute force learning mechanism. And the thing with AI is, is that AI can just process millions or billions of searches, results, and things to, to, to aggregate what, what is probably the best actual result for what you were looking for. And, and it, you know, I guess the thing would say alpha zero, alpha go zero and the whole zero aspect of that, that, you know, there was a human and then they build a machine to beat the human, but then they built a machine to build the machine that built the human. And, you know, the time frame that the, uh, the zero you required was hours to beat the machine that beat the human. And the machine took a long, long time from the documentary, you know, they'd spent ages programming it. And then the next iteration, they just said, go learn. They didn't tell it how to learn. It just learned. And, you know, therefore those are areas that AI can, can progress very, very fast, inconceivably fast in relation to, to what we're able to imagine can happen. And on one hand, that's very interesting. That can, that can throw up ways to be used that we never thought of. But, you know, in, a, in our wider context here of misuse by humans too, the technology is all, always neutral. But, but, but in this case, not only do we have potential misuse by humans, we have the, the Skynet scenario or Ray Kurzweil's the singularity uh, concept, you know, that what happens when machines achieve consciousness. Now, in this, in a, initially, I think he said 2028 or 2035, the singularity will happen. But a lot of other people then talk about general AI and local AI. And, you know, y you've got a machine that's the best ever Go player in the, in the world, but it can't make you a cup of tea or do up its shoelaces. So therefore, you know, AI for now can do things, a certain task very, very well, but it can't necessarily achieve consciousness. And it's been interesting because it's, it's pushed a lot of study into the human brain to realize that the, the human brain, uh, what's going on there, is amazingly complex. And it's almost more amazing for the complexity of what it does. How, how does it even fit in our head? And, and how do, does our head not overheat based on the amount of things that it's doing? So, therefore, to get AI to replicate the human brain may, may be some degree further off than we think. Except then when we factor in the exponential factor, it could really happen quickly. So, I, I think the trouble is, is, a bit, a bit like social media, we're, we're in an open-ended experiment where we don't have the ability to hit the red stop button on this one. So, um, you know, it's, it's a good question. And I'm not sure, you know, if one day AI becomes sentient, what we would do about that, because it, it's probably already smarter than us, you know? Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's the biggest thing. And there's, there's a lot of people, just, just one question. I don't want to go too much because we've been here for one hour. I still have two more questions. I'll try to synthesize, synthesize it. But one question I have, probably the, the most important thing. So do you believe, especially because we are all on that, like you said, there's already a lot of uh, areas where AI is becoming quite advanced. And, and for instance, even the way the algorithms are interacting with our daily lives and the phones and the sensors and stuff like that is already, it's there. But do you see this as a kind of a, for instance, Ben Gorsel, which is one of the biggest authorities and other people talking about singularity or open AI. But at the same time, if you look at as, uh, 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 especially, um, and I, I really like the approach of Harari um, in the sense of the 20th lessons of the 20th century, is much more talking and Elon Musk are talking much more that we need to regulate AI and really the producers of AI, or at least these machines, because of course we know that humanity doesn't think uh, global it's very difficult to get everyone aligned and and we have different velocities and as the algorithms start to talk and advance there will be some algorithms that will crush out algorithms and stuff like that so do you see this kind of vision more peaceful like uh, singularity open singularity like ben gorsel or more radical like ben uh, like uh, uh, elon musk or even Harari and, and even me i am in that that part that i see more that we have to act right now because things are not going to be so colorful and so peaceful as we might see it. Yeah, look, I mean, and I think in some ways, uh, through our whole conversation, we have discussed aspects of tech being used not for good. And at the same time, it then forces people to work out, well, what is good? What does good look like? And how do we ensure that it isn't misused? And, and so therefore, that's, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind uh, with, 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 with the populist leaders, because on the other hand, uh, if, if, if the, whole, the whole discussion and, and desire to embrace data, data-based decisions, 
uh, I think can sometimes help to rein back in people looking to do it for negative reasons. Therefore, if we're talking about AI, yes, I think we really do need to, to bring in a concept of ethics and a right way to do it. I mean, and so, you know, so I mean, so as, as I'm off, I guess what's happened with a lot of things is people have predicted long before we actually made the things, the kind of issues that we'd have to wrestle with. So his three laws of robotics, you know, do no harm to others, uh, help to work humans, but then work out how does that play out? Um, I guess people are trying to codify this and come up with this. Um, and because at the moment AI does only very narrow things very well, rather than being, you know, a wider authority on everything, we do still have the scope and the potential to, to ideally harness this. I mean, and, you know, I guess there are two aspects then. It can be done. Uh, on the other hand, potentially, uh, does, does AI bring out a better side in humanity? And again, you know, we're always, I'd always go between glass half full and not quite half full. So, so I, I wouldn't want to be a techno solutionist on this one. But in some ways, you know, life expectancy is rising. Potentially, overall, um, quality of life is going up. Um, now, you know, we can always talk about areas where bad things happen. But overall, you know, um, people's quality of lives is rising. And, and ideally, if AI uh, removes the drudge work and every time a job is re replicable, it gets outsourced to AI or robotics to allow hopefully humans to go further up the, the, the work chain in terms of the, the things that they do for their lives for interest. And with the discussion about uh, universal benefit, um, you know, if we're going to look at this, rather than in doom and gloom, potentially we could be moving to a scenario where hopefully people have happier, happier, longer lives and AI is a tool to help us achieve that. Now, obviously that raises all the, and again, I guess you and I journalistically, that raises the question, how, who's going to do that? Why are we going to do that? And I guess that's why the, you know, the, the expression about, you know, um, crisis is living in an interesting time, you know, a challenging time. Uh, we are in an interesting time. But, but maybe that makes things more interesting. You know, we don't have all the answers, but we know at least the questions we need to be answering. And we have, we're, we're codifying what does good look like and what does not good look like? And, you know, how do we try and hold people to better standards? I mean, I think, I think as humans, if we go back to, you know, our lizard brain and news coverage, news coverage focuses on the dictators, Belarus, these kind of places. But, but actually, you know, there's a lot of good things that we're doing too. Uh, that are improving our quality of lives. So hopefully then AI is an, an enabler for us to achieve this, you know, fingers crossed. Okay, okay, I think you didn't get it. So my question is, how do you see the challenge in terms of uh, the COVID-19 uh, yeah. and the opportunity and the challenge that come out of this and as well specifically the area of, uh, um, of uh, both the, the, the preparation for this innovation, but as well the changes that this will operate in society? Yeah, look, uh, it's a great question. Uh, I think a very interesting aspect is, is before this kicked off, you know, if we think about Greta Thunberg, you know, there was a rising conversation about climate change and the need to be aware of rising levels of CO2 and global warming. And that, that hasn't gone away, right? So therefore, suddenly we had this, you know, no, nobody would have imagined shut down the aviation industry for three to six months, you know? So... So, so we had a very real issue that didn't go away, but that was becoming very important before this happened. And then we had this, uh, like you say, this, uh, this laboratory lab period of what happens if we stop humans moving. Um, and, and then some companies have made a lot of money over the last six months. Um, so, so this shows that while it triggered a recession and it triggered a massive change in probably the way we do things, uh, it didn't stop people spending money. It didn't stop money being made. So, so therefore, that shows that um, we're going to have to transform. We're going to have to do things differently. But it didn't stop us doing things. And with, the, I guess, another good thing with the push to digital is, is in many ways, uh, we could have done this sooner. But, but the barrier was was hum was humans and middle managers and you can't work remotely. We couldn't do remote work. We couldn't do conference calls. We couldn't do things like this. It all had to be conferences. It had to be in the office. And, and so 
the last six months have shown that it doesn't have to be like that. Yes, some things need to be done face to face, but a lot of things don't. And there always used to be three criteria for middle managers. It would be um, the quality of your work, the timeliness of your work, and how long is your bum sitting on the seat. Whereas really, if someone's a great worker and they tick one and two, they don't need to be there in the office before you and after you. If their productivity is right, then, 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 then that's what you want. You don't need them there. And, the, and, and this could be transformative because, you know, like I, I, I had job, jobs sometimes where I was commuting for, uh, two hours each way, you know, because they wanted me there in the office five days a week. But, but really, you know, I'm not really sure if that was necessary. And therefore, I think if we look at this as a massive opportunity to, to, to challenge many of the things that we've said can only be done one way then we have a great opportunity. And this is why I mentioned climate change, because if we tie the two together, uh, we have to change some things. The last six months have shown that we can change things. So we'd be foolish not to put the two together and work out, well, we don't have to do some of those things. We need to do these things. How can we mesh the two together? And then obviously the third pillar for us is, you know, technology and emerging solutions to do things better, to have better solar panels, to have better wind turbines, to be more efficient, to, to, to assess more ruthlessly what do we really need to do physically and what can be done virtually. Um, so, you know, like we're not in a great state with all the indicators in terms of climate change. But equally, you know, humanity has been pretty interesting and innovative over the last millennia and more. So therefore, you know, it, it would have only itself to blame if it can't work out ways to live in a more sustainable way in the future. And, and the technology can be a fantastic enabler for that. Again, without completely drinking the Kool-Aid and being a techno solutionist, I still think, as we said with the William Gibson quote, there are a lot of ways that, that we could be living in, a, in, in healthier, cleaner ways that would help the planet and therefore work for all of us. So I, th I think we can be positive as, w as long as we're willing to be part of that solution. Well, I think it's a great way to wrap up. Um, I don't know, just as a last, uh, last uh, um, final remark, is there anything you want to talk about, uh, special where people can find you about the Irish Tech News for the people that don't know about it? Um, and there's a little bit of promotion about the work you're doing <laughs> right now. Um, yeah, look, thanks. So I guess um, I'm on Twitter. It's at Simon Cocking. I'm on LinkedIn, the same. Uh, Irish Tech News is on those platforms. And obviously the website, just type in Irish Tech News. Um, we're quite findable. So, so that's great. Um, we are, like you, are starting to do more in the way of podcasts because, again, the last six months have been interesting and a lot of people, all, all our articles, we have a lovely plug-in, all our articles can be listened to anyway. And then obviously we have podcasts too. So it means that people are curating what they take with them when they go and walk the dog or go to the gym. And it's really nice to know that some of our pieces are mixed into their playlist while they're out off doing things. And I think, I think that's great. And uh, the feedback is useful because it helps us to work out what other areas people would like to hear about. So I guess th that's where, and SoundCloud, iTunes, that's where you'll find us. Um, and I guess it's just nice to do this and then work out what people enjoyed and what people want to hear more about. Fantastic. Well, it's been a big pleasure, Simon. I think there's a lot of things here, a lot of notes that we're going to put as well. We're going to put your bio uh, in our multiple websites. But I want to thank you for this. Uh, excellent. That I think we have probably material to go for a couple of hours, but I think for, the, uh, for today we, st we stay here. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you very much.